everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar with a very cool guy and an excellent guitarist today, multi-talented Matt Stevens. Um, I want to take a brief second just to thank our mutual friend, Terry Lynn Carrington, drummer extraordinaire for hooking us up. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Uh, give you a brief background on Matt and then we'll get into it. He's a Grammy nominated guitarist living in New York City. As a session player, he's played on over 70 records with artists like Terry Lynn Carrington, Esperanza Spaulding, Christian Scott, Atunde Ajua. Did I get that right? Atunde Ajua. Yeah. Atunde Ajua. I always yeah, mess yeah. up. This, always the accent's always on the wrong place. <laughs> uh, Harvey Mason. And uh, I had, um, you know, Lionel Luicky? Yeah, yeah. Luicky. Yeah, he was on last week. I got, every, I, I got almost every name there wrong. Uh, <laughs> Harvey Mason and others. And he's worked with producers, including Quincy Jones, Glenn Ballard, and Tony Visconti. As a producer himself, he's worked on Esperanza, Esperanza Spaulding's albums, Exposure, and the Grammy-winning 12 Little Spells, and on Terry Lynn Carrington's double album, Waiting Game, which Terry spoke extensively about, if you want to check it out in that interview. Uh, Matt has a really great style of playing. It's kind of a combination of jazz, rock, and ambient music. He's got five solo records, including his most recent that's coming out soon, uh, and that record is called Pittsburgh. And he also teaches at the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, Maryland. Man, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, Craig, thanks for inviting me. I really, my, really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Uh, all right. You're originally from Canada? Yeah. When did you move to the States and what prompted that move? Um, I had no intention to move to the States. but <laughs> I, Oh, wow. I, 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 it was sort of accidental. I, I moved when I was, uh, when I was 18. So I, I was finishing high school. And I'd, I auditioned for the local music program at, at the University of Toronto, and um, I wasn't accepted. And and I sort of thought, okay, well, I guess I guess that's that. I don't know what I'll do. You know, maybe I'll try again next year. I'll just hang out. You know, I had a girlfriend, and to, you know, I was just happy to kind of bum around and do whatever. And so, um, my uh, my my parents actually really encouraged me to. Um, to, to audition for this like summer guitar workshop at, at Berkeley. Oh and yeah, so, yeah. So my mom said, just do, just do it, you know, just make it, make a tape. And I made this tape and she sent it in and I got a scholarship to go to the camp. And then when I was there, um, I auditioned, they, I got to audition for the school and they gave me a scholarship to go to the school. Oh, and wow. So, and so I, uh, it was all kind of, you know, accidental. It was all, you know, kind of off of not getting into the music program at U of T. And then I, um, I, I needed to make some American money. And so I, I took a job on a cruise ship, had my 19th birthday. That must have been so much fun for a 19 year old musician. Oh my Dude, God. It was crazy. I was, I was, I was 18 when I, I, I was so green, you know, I went from my, from my, the bedroom at my parents' house to, to a, to a, a cruise ship <laughs> and uh you know and that was yeah that was wild so I, I just made some american money doing that that's really cool and so uh uh had had did that whole situation impact your things that have happened to you along the way like uh because i know me as i've gotten older if something doesn't work out i'm like i'm good with it because I'm trusting more that the universe is like, okay, there's other plans. There's a reason why I was curious. Did that have an impact on you like that? Certainly. I think that like it impacted me in a lot of ways, certainly in that way that I've, I've, um, I'm, I'm quick to look at, you know, the bright side of a situation and kind of, and, and recognize that unexpected things can happen, uh, you know, given, uh, a situation maybe not working out how you had anticipated it working out or hoping it would work out um because yeah i certainly for i was gonna say i don't think but i i actually know that my that you know my, my career wouldn't be uh anything like it is or look even remotely like it does if i had never uh found myself in berkeley and then in new york etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah it, it just wouldn't have happened you know? that's really cool yeah. yeah, it's good that you get that at an early age because it, it's also like you said, so much better to be positive about it. Just leaves you room for better stuff moving forward, you know. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Less stress. Yeah, it took me a while to get over not get being sort of feel a feeling of being rejected by my hometown. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but but once I got over that, or uh, you know, it, it, I was able to sort of see the bright side for sure. So, did you grow up in Toronto? 
I did, yeah. Oh, so it's a big city. So like yeah. Boston, New York was not no big culture shock thing for you. No, certainly. Oh, not. very cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, were were your parents musical? My mom, um, I'd say my mom was musical or is musical. She she just retired um, uh, after fifty years uh, teaching at the National Ballet School. In, wow, in, in Toronto. So. Uh, my and my dad is a great fan of music. Um, I, we were talking earlier. He's from he's from Liverpool, and, and you know, exposed me to a lot of really great, you know, blues and rock very very early. And so, right. yeah, there was a lot have of music in the house. Have you been there to see like his family or something? I have not. I've been to England a lot, but strangely, never to Liverpool. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and most of his family came to came to Canada or uh, you know are no longer living. So it's sure, like, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. Okay. So you go to Berkeley, uh, summer program, you do well there. Then you go to Berkeley as a student. You're there for one or two years. I was there for three years, three years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then after that, how did you get started in the music business? And, and maybe what was your, what was your big break? I think my big break was playing with Christian Scott. Um, so when I was at school, um, he, you know, he was a big deal even when he was sort of a big man on campus, even when he just kind of showed up like he, oh. he um, you know, he came from New Orleans and he already had been touring a lot with his uncle, a guy named Donald Harrison, who played with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers and, you know, had made a bunch of records in Columbia with Terrence Blanchard. He, he already had a name. And Christian, um, you know, like things were things were happening for him <laughs> almost yeah. immediately. And he so he was like trying to put a band together, like when he was in school. And so we started going out and doing like, like, like dates, like, like, you know, f fly dates and stuff when we were still in college. Audience. And then, wow. and then he, um, when we finished school, we, we finished the same year and he, um, you know, when he left, he had a multi record deal with Concord and, and we, we recorded his first record for Concord when we were still Berkeley students. And, uh, wow. Yeah, and so I was really, you know, fortunate to find myself in that situation because I had, you know, I had a way to make a transition to, like, you know, pay, to, to to New York City and to pay my rent without, you know, without having to, you know, bag groceries or work at a coffee shop or something like that. Like yeah, it wasn't, sure. It was nothing to write home about, but it was enough that I could like have the time to practice and, and do what I wanted to do and just hang out and meet people, you know? Well, there was no downtime for you either. You're still in music yeah, right away. That's, exactly. Yeah. That's really cool. You that's know? great. Yeah. What, did, what was it like as, did you talk, how was it a world tour or just the States? Um, so, I mean, basically immediately he was doing, you know, he was, he was, he, he, he had a lot behind him at that time and still does. But at that time, I mean, we were doing like, I would say almost a hundred dates a year in Europe, all over the States, Japan, you know, and, and, and he would, you know, it was making a, making a record every two years, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty full time, you know? So it was like the normal cycle, make a record tour for a year and a half, make another, wow, yeah. that's great. And you toured yeah. the world. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. It was really, it was really cool. What are maybe some like early lessons that that first gig with Christian Scott taught you that you like retained for the, for your career? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know about lessons so much, but as, as, as like observations, you know, yeah. I think that I sort of, I, I think I clued into um, the fact pretty early on that some people are just really wonderfully natural, charismatic performers, you know? Um, and he was certainly one of those people. That, that I that I was around, um, and you know, and I and I think that one of the the lessons that I kind of or things that I observed rather was that um, I'm not that way. <laughs> yeah. You know that that it doesn't come naturally to me. You know, or at least so in that. You mean being outgoing? Being well, being being a very like a, a very charismatic, um, comfortable performer on stage. Okay. You know? Yeah. I always I always preferred to. I really like playing out, but I also I think I, I think I would have been a great candidate for 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 the kind of guy who's going to like you know show up at 
at the at the studio every day at 10 a.m. with his packed lunch and, and he was home for dinner, you know, like <laughs> and do it all behind the scenes. Yeah, so yeah. it would have been great in like a radio orchestra in the 60s or something. I don't know. Sure, sure. But um, I, I I sort of I I realized that um, you know, I really wanted to um, have my own band, you know, um, but I was going to have to kind of find a way to 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 lead it and to do it in a way that was not what I was you know, sort of seeing on stage every night with Christian, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So how, I want to get back to another thing you learned, but how did you, as a leader, how do you navigate that? I'm, I'm, it's something that is constantly on my mind and I'm, and I'm yeah. thinking about because you can't, you can, you can, I think that you can kind of turn up, the volume on things that come naturally to you, but you can't yeah. put on someone else's suit, you know, at least yeah. that's my, I, I agree. Yeah. That's my experience with it. So you can't look at somebody and go, well, that person's a really great performer. They, or they engage really well with the audience or they're, they're, they're so charismatic on stage. I'll just do that. It never works. It's, it's awful. It's hard to, it's hard to watch when other people do that. Um, so I think that much like, um, much like playing, you really have to kind of, um, work hard and, and, and consistently to kind of identify things about yourself that maybe come naturally to you or that feel uh, true and, and, and then develop those things, you know, um, or work, work to amplify those things. So yeah. it's something that I'm still, I, honestly, I still struggle with it. And I'm still sure. figuring, figuring it out. Um, yeah, how do I, uh, you know, how do I be in that space? be in front of people um in a way that feels uh true and open and engaging you know yeah yeah it's a, that's a tough one it is a tough one are you are you you're not are you shy by nature or no i'm not shy yeah i'm not shy by nature i i actually think i'm pretty outgoing but um in 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 just regular social situations you know yeah but i um but i do feel sometimes i, I feel i feel pretty shy on stage actually it's it, it's interesting a lot of people are the opposite right you hear a lot of people say oh i'm just i'm i'm, I'm a ball of nerves and, and then when i get on stage i'm my true self you know it's sort of the opposite for me <laughs> but i've also had a lot of guys on the show they're shy but when they go on stage it's like i it's like uh changing costumes right you know and they're like and then they get off stage and it's been a, a lot of people that are like that it's been so intense and draining right when they get off stage they're like i'm wiped out because yeah. it it's not me naturally and it, it takes a lot out of me so you I mean it's six of one it's just a lot of it's interesting to see everybody's uh comfort level it, it it really is and you know i i really want to be um more comfortable on stage and and being the the, the I, you know, I do, you know, I do on average, I don't know, like 20 to 30 dates a year with my own band. And I mean, and sometimes I feel more comfortable than other times, you know, but sure. I really do um, feel uh, shy on stage. I feel, I feel naturally somewhat uncomfortable being the, the, the center of attention, you know, and yeah. I, oftentimes I feel much more, um, comfortable supporting someone else or you know or, or yeah, working yeah. in the studio and, and and maybe it's just because i've done more of that in my life but maybe it's because i'm canadian i don't know man <laughs> i was waiting i know you spent uh, like 10 minutes you haven't apologized yet so. <laughs> exactly. 13 minutes i was like Whoa. uh but two you're probably playing in smaller clubs like if you're playing in the city you're probably playing in like the 55 club or yeah, that's a lot more intimidating than when you were Christian was probably playing not arenas, but like, you know, 2000 seat theaters or 100, well, 1000 seat theaters. Yeah, I'd say it's at the end of it, 500 to 1000 seat theaters. Yeah. So but I mean, when I go, I agree with you. I mean, when it's I tougher, you know, but it is it is tougher, you know, but I do. Like, um, but you're like in your living room there. Exactly. It's, like, it's exactly. that's that's. That's scary, man. To totally. And yeah. I mean, the times that I have played, you know, and when I when I tour in Europe, you know, it, you, you know, I'll, pl I'll play, you know, 100 to 300, you know, kind of capacity rooms, you know, and yeah, that feels like pretty good. It's still, well, you know, but the but it comes with I'm rare, rarely am I selling them out. I'll tell you that. But I mean, you yeah. know, what the, the stress that comes with, you know, it's sort of like 
it can be strict, you know, you're like these days, right? Like you're like, you know, as soon as you have a show booked, right? The, the promoter and your agent and everybody is sending you like, I was just talking to a friend about this. They're sending you like, you know, the ticket count, you know? So you can kind of just check in at any given moment of like how you're, t- you know, it's, so, it's like, it's gotta be pressure, man. Oh man. It's really something, you know, it's like, it's uh it's like looking at yourself on the, on the, you know, S and P or something like that, you know, like on the popularity scale in real time all the time, you know? So, so it is, I agree. Yeah, it, is, it can be stress. It totally sucks. So it can be stressful to kind of be in, in these smaller rooms and be like, oh, shit, man. Like, you know, feel like everybody's just kind of right up on you looking at everything you're doing um, versus, uh, you know, but the other side of it is, yeah, when you're in those bigger, more more potentially anonymous feeling places, you're, like, yeah, yeah. you're just hoping to God that you sell some tickets. Right. So it's oh like it's God. it's really it's really it's really wild, you know? So I think that that's part of it. Like, it's just it being all on you, you know? And I yeah. think that that just comes really, really naturally to some people and, uh, and less so to others. And I'm, I think I'm one of the less so, but it doesn't make me want to do it any less. It's just more painful. <laughs> well, also too, you look at someone like him and like Terry, where mm-hmm. they grew up and they had others, elder family members. Yeah. Help shepherd them into the business. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's inherent in them from a young age. Like that's the family business almost. Yeah. Yeah. You know? exactly. So it's, it's another thing that's tough, but man, that's a good, I, I give you credit for going out there and still doing it. Uh, what, any other observations from the um, early gigs? Yeah. I, um, you know, I think that, uh, I, I think that Christian has this in common with someone else, uh, with, with, um, with some other people that come to mind, Pat Matheny comes to mind. Um, someone who's more my age and a guitar, another guitar player. I've seen who's a guitar player is Julian Lodge, and I've seen him do this as well. Where he, you know, Christian Esperanza does this too. Lots of people do this, but um, my first exposure, I, I think, to it was Christian, and that is really knowing how to put a set together that really has a narrative and really flows. You know, um, and I think that that's something that is often like really, really overlooked, especially in, in the, in the, like the improvised slash jazz or whatever you want to call it. World, yeah. You know, totally. It's just like, let's just show up and we'll just, you know, play the songs we know in whatever order we feel like, you know, and we'll look like we just kind of came off the street Yeah, and that's cool. Right. And it's, kind of, you know, and people will like that. It's kind of like, well, and so to see the difference between that and this sort of like this kind of like session culture or like pickup gig kind of culture, you know, and people being like, "This is the this is the show that I play," um, you know, n- night in and night out. Um, and within those parameters, there's lots of room for you know for improvising and this and that. Sure. But this is how this is this is the arc that I constructed for this, you know. And, and yeah. And and it's intentional, and uh, it, you know, it has a it tells a story. You know, I think that I I. I was, I, I really noticed that with him early on, even though I was resistant to it. I was like, man, we're doing the same thing every night, man. Like why, you know, like, yeah, yeah. and and it's, and it's kind of like the luxury of being a side person, right? You're kind of like, oh man, why don't we play this song? Or why don't we mix it up a little bit, you know? And, and it took me some time to kind of realize that, you know, you're, you're, you're saying that because you're, you're coming from the place of, of you're not on the hook for anything, man. Yeah. You're the responsibility up, you know? of entertaining right. is, is not really on. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I had a, a guy on, on the show here, Mike Wanchik, who has been uh, John Mel- John Mellencamp's guitarist like 40 years and his music director. And one of the things he said that's most important to their success is structuring a gig. Right. And he said that they work so hard on that. And, and, and basically what he said is they take songs in like chunks of threes. Right. You know, and like you said, they have a certain arc and a certain storytelling line that John can go weave in throughout the things. And it's it is very important to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, man. Uh, I want to add I want to talk about some of the folks you've worked with, Matt, if you could tell me how you wound up uh, connecting with them and maybe an interesting story. Let's start out with uh, Terry Lynn Carrington. Yeah. Um, You know, so Terry teaches at Berkeley and she showed up right, um, I think the year after I left, she started working there. So we didn't cross paths there. Um, and that's, I think how, you know, Terry has really been like mining the, the Berkeley student body for a lot of musicians over the years you know, oh, to, to right. great, to great success. And, you know, she's really 
special, just a sidebar, she's special in that, um, you know, she is one of the few people who are really happy to just say, no one knows this person, but I don't care. I think they sound great. Let me bring them on board and, and hire them yeah, for gigs, you know? That's very cool. It's very that's cool. Re especially and, nowadays, because the first thing you, people are going to do when they find out who's in your band, they're going to yeah. go on social media. Exactly. And they're going to make an evaluation and say, yeah. well, he's yeah. only got 200 yeah. likes. Yeah. Why don't exactly. you use this guy? He's got, yeah. you yeah. know, 6,000 likes or 20,000. Exactly. Yeah, I know. So she just sort of sidesteps that whole thing, and she's not looking for someone else to kind of, you know, anoint some yeah. musician before she's willing to hire them, you know, which is really cool. But that's very cool. Yeah. We didn't we didn't connect that way. She called me out of the blue in 2015 or 2014, just for just for a tour, um, for for a couple of gigs in Europe. And I and um she told me that she told me that she just heard me on um I think I think she just heard me on some Christian Scott records and like my playing and that was it, you know? That's cool. No yeah. audition, nothing. No, that's yeah. awesome, man. You know, it's funny. That's that that whole that whole thing about of auditioning. Like, um, it's not really prevalent in like the. I know it's super prevalent and almost ubiquitous in in like the pop and rock world, especially in the pop in LA, world, yeah, especially in L.A. and in, in in the jazz world. It just sort of it, it's just not really part of the culture. It's sort of interesting, or if it is, it's it's unsaid. You know, yeah. like like I think I did sort of an audition last month with uh, <laughs> there was this. This this woman Rachel Z, who's a piano player, and she's married to the great drummer Omar Omar Hakim, you know. Okay, they yeah. This, they have this band, and um, I've known Rachel for a while, and and, I, and Omar, and um, that's a I think I think that's a band that Kurt Rosenwinkel's been doing, and I, I don't think he's doing it anymore. And they have some stuff coming up, and they you know they said, oh why don't you come just come up to the house and let's just play, you know come have dinner and we'll just play some tunes you know and hang out. It'd be great to see you you know. And that's about as close yeah. to as like an audition. That, you know, that was definitely an audition. Yeah. It's always unspoken though, you know, it's all, and, or, you know, or, or in other circumstances, you know, you'll just kind of hire someone for a gig and if you like how they play then then you call them back. And if you yeah. don't, then that was it, you know? But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, it's the yeah, a it's non audition audition. Exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that, that's, so, so Terry uh, heard you playing on Christian's record called you in 2014 for a yeah. tour in Europe. Obviously that must've went well. I guess so, you know. Yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess so. And then I, I sort of, you know, I just started working with her on and off, and then um, for and then I guess 2017 or something like that, we we started this project with Aaron Parks, that yeah. social science band, and um, yeah, and, and it's just been like it's been a joy, you know. So so and we you know we continue to work in in a variety of capacities. I was just with her a couple of weeks ago. I was recording another record with this this collective that I have with this co thing I have with the sex one is Walter Smith the third. Mm. And, um, yeah, it was fun. She, she, we had her up play drums and Dave Holland played bass and Chris Davis played piano. So that was, that'll be out next spring. And, you know, it's like, it's just a tight knit community of musicians, you know, in the, in the, in the, definitely in the, in the improvised improvising world. So we continue and to do lots of different stuff. It's fun. You did a record like, or several records with, with Walter, right? We've done two. Yeah. In then, common. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like we've done two. And then, um, this third one will be out in in uh, in March, I think. That's cool. And Terry was on it. That's nice, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you also did. I didn't talk about it in your bio, but you did some Spotify writing sessions. What are those about? And like, how did those? What is that all about? So, that I mean, that's basically just been through this uh, this publisher that I started working with a number of years ago. This guy named Pierce Steinwald in 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 Berlin, and he. Uh, it's a publisher called Buddha Music, and it's B-U-D-D-E, and it's named after a guy named Wolf Buddha, who was a big um, uh, independent music publisher in, in Germany, and, and uh, they've gone on to, to to expand over the years, and they're they're pretty cool. And basically, um, yeah, Peter Peter has been a big champion for me, and and has you know slowly just um, sent me to a number of writing camps. So you know, in the last few years you know and that's like really really new for me um but really really fun yeah it must um, be great yeah it's really fun and and totally off the beaten path from things that i've usually done so um yeah that that the before the pandemic um specifically there was a there was a um one sponsored by spotify that we went and did it um uh at um a studio called jungle studios in new york i think it's i think it's alicia keys's own studio which is kind of amazing because yeah it's like that's pretty cool whole complex that was like she owns all of this this is all wow. you know it's like wow 
man, this is amazing. Um, it's it like, fun. it's just like an example, an unfortunate example of like before streaming. <laughs> yeah, totally. And uh, I mean, like, totally. you totally. know, it's like, right. And, and, here, and here we are doing this at this, the studio that streaming certainly didn't build for a streaming service, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was cool. It was, you know, it was, um, some neat stuff came out of that, um, specifically with a, a really amazing uh, artist out of Chicago named Jamila Woods, who, who I just think is incredible. And um, so, yeah, we have a couple of things from that session that we've been uh, ironing out that we're looking forward to releasing at some point soon. Now, what what's in it for Spotify? That's a good question. I think that, um, I think it's twofold. I think, um, well, they they have no ownership over any of the content created there. Okay, I, think, I was wondering. Yeah, about yeah, that. they don't. Um, however, I think that um, you know they can point to two things. One, kind of just a cool factor of like bringing different people from different yeah. kind of you know schools of music together and writing, and and supporting the you know hopefully interesting music that comes out of those sessions. Yeah. But also, I think it's I think it's sort of like a. Um, uh, like an, an optical move, you know, I think it, I think they want to sort of um, clearly demonstrate that they are supporting musicians and music creation, that kind of, you know, I think we're not going to pay anything, but we'll give you lunch. <laughs> exactly. You know, we'll cater this lunch and we will give you, you know, sort of free reign in the studio. And, you know, right. I think it's like, I think it's, yeah, like kind of like, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, music philanthropy to, to, to benefit, you know, the way that they yeah. or something like that. That's, that's the only thing that I could kind of think of that would make any sense. Now, is there any, like, can you use, can you record, if, if some recording comes out of this, can you go back and use their assets to do this? Right. And so I believe that that is the, another unspoken part of it, you know? So I left with like, you know, I left that session with, I just brought my hard drive at the end and I just had everything that I'd done with, you know, all these, all these different people just dumped on it. Right. And, um, and, and, you know, and then after that, the conversation kind of moves away from them and just between myself and the different people that I was working with. And, you know, it just moved to, what do you want to do with this? Do you want to work on this or what should we do? And maybe we should pitch it to this person or that person. Um, but I definitely kept it in the back of my mind, you know, gosh, I think that I wonder if, if Spotify would just kind of throw a little bit you know, throw throw a little bit of its muscle behind something that comes out of a session. Yeah, it, it, it curates. It would only make sense for them to, to do so. You know. Well, what's um, the point otherwise? Almost like I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it, I. It just seems weird. It does seem weird. Yeah. Especially, you know, I mean, honestly, the whole the whole thing is is a lot to wrap my mind around. Like the entire yeah. um, the whole the whole pitching to playlists thing, and and um, you know, and, and yeah. The idea that it's um, like a totally dip uh, democratic platform that, you know, that like that I just don't see any world in which what they profess to be the case to actually be the case. Like, you know, that, that, that some unknown artist has the same, um, uh, you know, likelihood of getting placed on the playlist as, as you know, a, a major pop artist, you know, like it's this it's this pitching thing. Yeah, I don't get these, yeah. It's no way, right? No way I mean, at all. I don't. No, way. no, it's 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 just it's totally it's totally impossible. Um, so, so I think that like, nor is it in their best interest because, I mean, they they get paid more when people stream because they get a, a P, I mean, I I don't I don't get it. It's just weird. Yeah, it is really it is really weird, you know. So, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like they're, you know, trying to kind of balance it and kind of have it both ways in a sense, right? They're trying yeah. to look like they really support uh, independent, you know, kind of relatively unknown artists and up and coming artists and that, that that platform in of itself can really, you know, break somebody or, you know, um, or, or, or offer an opportunity to someone. Um, but yeah, it's not in, it's sort of not necessarily in their best interest. So it's hard to say. It's weird. Yeah. Well, hopefully they will let you, they'll throw something behind it. If you make a record out of that would, that would be cool. Then the whole yes. thing would be like, yeah, that was really cool. You hooked us up. We put something together. Yeah. You funded it. We use your studios yeah. and you helped us put it out there on your own separate playlist or whatever. Exactly. That would be cool. Yeah. It would be cool. You know, Jamil and I have this song that we like, and I think we're going to release it as a single. And I would definitely be watching closely to see, to see what happens. You know, it's Good, really man. interesting. Yeah. It's funny. You know, like I, uh, 
yeah but anyways not to go on about spotify but it's really it's it's really smoke and mirrors to me you know it's like yeah. everybody who i've had on the show has who's met with them even for various they say feel the same way yeah. yeah i've done some other stuff with them i've been to their studio recording with esperanza in new york for these live sessions and and i i it's all it's you know it's all sort of promotional right i mean for for the artist supposedly right but yeah it's interesting to see how it works and also you know i, I had this kind of side project that i that is a passion project with two guys and this, it's this band called 60 and it's kind of more of like a a songwriter thingy you know there's a, there's our our, our 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 friend Corey king is a great singer and he sings in the band and and, and we've just been releasing sing a set of a series of singles on spotify and it's been really S- S-I-X-T-Y to see. or the number exactly. six? Okay, yeah. so S-I-X-T-Y, okay. Yeah, and it's been interesting to see how that's gone, you know, and sort of and trying to make heads or tails of it, you know, where the, where the, you know, seeing how the first thing we released, you know, within a, racked up, you know, I don't know, not a, not a, not a paltry number, but, you know, something in the 60 or 70,000 plays within, with like, a, you know, within the first month or two, and then it was just totally dormant, and then, I think you know eight or nine months after the fact it started to pick up again via these algorithmic playlists and i was talking to my publisher i said did somebody you know flag like who is it a person putting this back in rotation and he says no i don't think it is it is an algorithm but how that algorithm works what it is what it does is just it's just dumbfounding you know i don't know it's so weird man i know i know it really is is if somebody wants to listen to sixties, any of that music out? I mean, it's yes. on Spotify, but is it's it on anywhere Spotify, else? Apple Music, YouTube, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Quincy Jones, what'd you do with Quincy Jones? <laughs> he produced a record. So I, I did a couple of records with with a piano player named Justin Coughlin from Virginia Beach. Um, I think he's from Virginia Beach, and the, the and. Uh, He's he's signed to Quincy's management agency, and Quincy produced the first record that he did, and so we get to spend a couple of days with him. It was really it was a lot of fun, man, and, and I mean, it was it was it was also pretty 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 wild and pretty bizarre. I mean, he, I think that um, I'm sure you've probably heard that he I think he works overnight exclusively. Like he doesn't like to you know record during the day. So the session started at like seven thirty at night, and we went till you know six in the morning, like that oh, kind of man. thing. And this is a guy, you know, he's in his, he was already he's, in his eighties. Yeah. Time, yeah. You know? So that was, you know, that was that he, I remember he was sort of really made. He was like, man, man, I can't believe how well you can read, you know, about like, yourself. Yeah. yeah. About me. He said, God, you can't believe how well you read music. It's just incredible. You know, guitar players just can't read like that. And I like, and Which I is, didn't have, and I didn't true. have the heart to tell him, I got this music a month ago, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, like, I sort of was like, I just. <laughs> this ain't the, you should have heard me day one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I was going, shit, man. There's no way I would be reading this stuff. Uh, off the top, you know, but I, okay, I didn't have that so hard to tell them, man. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> or rather, I didn't want to, you know. No, don't take away your own little yeah, thunder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, it was funny. And that's I remember, great, man. Yeah, that one of those nights, too, it was really funny. He was, we were, we were, we were ordering in from someplace i think we were ordering in from roscoe's chicken and waffles you know like with the whole band and yeah and and um his daughter rashida had been sending him to the session with like these packed dinners you know like like steamed vegetables and like you know like a <laughs> grilled, grilled <laughs> like to eat healthy to eat healthy yeah he's like and uh remember, pass on the know, kale <laughs> and he had this thing and we were putting our order in and he was like i think he you know he ordered something you know and he and he <laughs> the whole time <laughs> I can't remember. He had one of the he had one of the the, the assistants stand by the door because Rashid had sort of been in and out, you know. And he had somebody just kind of guard the door the whole time to make sure that he could, you know, get rid of get rid get of get rid of the chicken and waffles. Of, yeah, exactly, and pull his kale in front of him where <laughs> Rashid to walk in. Oh yeah, my god, really that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh man. Hey, maybe that's the secret to longevity: work exactly. all night long. That's you right. Know, eat shitty food. Exactly. And, uh, you know, he was a big smoker when he was a kid too. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. That's wild. Um, is there anything in working with him, any observations that you were like, ah, now I see like what led him to be so successful? You know, what, what I, what I remember about just spending a, a couple of days with him, you know, and I, it's really only been that, you know, so, um, but what I remember was just 
um, feeling like he, after all this time, like he, there was his love and, and curiosity about music was yeah. in no way diminished. And if anything, it just continued to sort of bloom, you know? And I think that, you know, I think it's just that. <laughs> I think it's just yeah. that feeling of being like a per, like perpetually um, amazed by music and its 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 power and um, and um, it was just that it was infectious, you know. Yeah. It was like that was that kind of thing, you know. Enthusiasm so, usually is, man. Yeah. Genuine, it's re- it usually is, man. Yeah, yeah. And another great producer you work with, Tony Visconti. Mm-hmm. What, how did that come about? So Tony worked on the Tony produced the first record that I worked on with Esperanza. Okay. Um, so, and that was really really fun, um, because it was that that record is called D Plus um, Evolution, Emily's D Plus Evolution, and it's it's you know it's basically just guitar, bass, and drums. And um, I mean we got we got all these wild comparisons to like music that we were like you know we'd be seeing like some review and it would be like oh man it's got this it reminds us of like captain beefheart or something we'd all be going like who the fuck is captain beef i never heard you know this kind of stuff it had this kind of like uh, i wouldn't really you know, think that would sound like no. captain <laughs> you know but it, i guess i guess the idea was that it was it was sort of like i think the way that like you know maybe um like a larger harmonic palette you know um but but played with like you know like gnarly electric guitar and and, and you know bass and like really yeah. a really powerful drummer kind of hit people in this kind of proggy kind of way you know or something I don't know that's um, weird it, yeah, it was interesting you know people's points of reference are always are always really fascinating you know and like it's it's like you get that as a guitar player all all the time right it's like one you know one one night you're at a, you know, some guys going, "Oh man, I love, I love it." You sound, man, you really remind me of John McLaughlin. The next night it's John Abercrombie. The night, the next night it's Pat Metheny. The next yeah. night, it's, you know, Schofield. It's always, in, you know, it's, it's someone's direct point of reference. So totally. It's, hey, well, if they're calling, if those are the the names they're calling out, it's like you're doing the right thing, no matter what you sound like. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Yeah, I that's guess that's cool. a way to look at it. But you know, oh, it's, yeah. it's 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 uh, but but he produced this Esperanza record, and um, you know, because. I think she was just on the crazy Bowie kick, you know, for like a number of years, you know, and she was just like, I got to get this guy. <laughs> and she, and he was totally game. And, um, um, you know, it was fun. I got to spend a couple of days with him just doing guitars, you know, and, Oh, that and must've been great. It was really, really fun. You know, in New York city, you said you recorded yeah, in, in New yeah. York city. Yeah. And, uh, well, there, most, most of the record was in LA at, at, at a place called NRG. Okay. And then, um, I think she cut a lot of the vocals and we did a lot of the guitars at, at, a at, at his son's studio. His son is a big um, commercial music uh, composer. And I remember reading there's something about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so What's he, it? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying he has a pretty, he has a really great, you know, kind of project studio in, in, in Manhattan. And that's, that's where we, where we. That's got to be that. cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Man. Mm-hmm. Biggest differences between him and Quincy as far as how they approach production. Um, you know, I think that they were, they were both they both gave a lot of space you know and i think that they both um chose their words really wisely i think that uh um you know i think tony was was a lot more maybe as a guitar player himself he was a lot more hand my in my experience he was a lot more hands-on in terms of um like you know he was like on his hands and knees like you know turning dot like being like oh let's do this and here like oh let's pull this pedal out and let's do this with it. And, you know, he was like okay. a lot more, um, uh, involved, you know, as an engineer, he had an engineer working for him, but he was, you know, he was sort of, you know, he had his hands on the board a lot more and he was, yeah. um, you know, and, and he was in the, you know, he was in the, in the amp closet with me a lot being like, let's do this and let's do this and let's move the mic here. You know, it was a lot more, uh, that way. Um, which is fun and a pain in the ass. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. You yeah. Know? It's, uh, it's fun because you're doing new stuff. It's a pain in the ass because she's like, well, do it again with this. I know. Exa- exactly. Yeah. You know, it was, um, but he, you know, he was, um, yeah, Tony, Tony was, was, was cool. He was, um, I think that he like, I think he was having a lot of fun doing it. I think it was like, um, it was really different for him, I think, because I don't, you know, it was, I mean, at its core, it's a, it's a jazz record, you know, right. and I think that like, so, you know, there's a lot of like, 
phrases in, in, in you know, different time signatures or, you know, like I, I, I imagine and, and a lot of different harmony and things like that. And so I think, it, you know, it was, you know, I mean, granted Bowie's made a lot of really interesting and complex music over the years, but I think it yeah. was like, it was not something that he, um, you know, was, was like in his wheelhouse necessarily, or that he had a lot of experience doing, you know? So he right, was like, right. he actually, I remember him asking a lot of questions, you know, which was kind of, which was kind of cool, actually, you know, yeah. really cool. Like what chord is that? Or, Oh man, what do you, you know, like, what are you guys doing there when it kind of moves to this thing or, you know, and, um, you know, and a lot of people, I think that like, uh, you know, don't want to show kind of, you know, vulnerability or weakness, you know, but it's interesting in my experience, it always just strengthens the connection, right? Like to, for me, I just go shit, like it makes me want to work with it even, you know, more. And it just like really creates for a great atmosphere. It doesn't make me think any less of it. It makes me think more of them. It's so funny. You mentioned that I was just watching this video and there's a, it's, I think it's on YouTube. It's something about charisma, but I like the headline. It was top five things not to do in a meeting to, to get people to dislike you. And it had an example of, um, what's that show, uh, with Mark Cuban and all the entre entrepreneurs. Oh yeah. Uh, Shark Tank. Sh Shark Tank. Yeah. Sorry. I'm having a brain fart. Uh, this is, see, this happens more uh, th just preparing you. Uh, Come on, man. I, I never, I never had these brain farts in my late 40s, <laughs> early fifties. Now it's like, it's on the tip of my tongue. I, I just read the article 10 minutes. I just watched the video 10 minutes ago. Anyway. And, uh, it was this episode with this guy. And one of the things he did that really turned people off was they asked him a question and he didn't know the answer. And instead of saying, you know, I, I really don't know, or, you know, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to get back with you. He covered it up and pretended like he was just whiz bang. And you're at those guys. It's not called shark tank for a reason. Those guys are really smart and they all like, come on, man, you're full of shit, you know? Yeah. And, and the lesson the guy said was people are often afraid of not knowing something, but being authentic that you don't know something is a, will endear someone to you because it shows that you're trustworthy. Totally. You know, so, yep. you know, that's really cool that he said, you know, how, how I don't know how to, you know, it was like, wow, even Tony Visconti doesn't know something. That's pretty cool. So I yeah. shouldn't feel so bad about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite session? that you've ever done or, uh, wrote, uh, or tour. Oh my God. Um, gosh, I don't, you know, I honestly can't say that I have, that I, that I have a favorite. I have, I have, so, I have a couple that, you know, are front of, are front of mind for me, you know? Yeah. Let's um, talk about those. Yeah. Yeah. One, um, you know, one, one that comes to mind is, is a, uh, a Christian Scott record called Yesterday You Said Tomorrow. Um, and I think it was just, it was at a time in my life where, um, you know, I was, I was just like really, really, I was, I don't know, 27 or 28 and, and things were like, I was starting to feel like I could kind of play how I wanted to play and, 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 and things were starting to move in the right direction. And, and, and it was, but that particular band had, had an unbelievable drummer named Jemiah Williams in it, and and you know, and I was really influenced by my my peers and in, in in the band, and we were just really, it was it, we were really going for something at that moment, and it just felt like, like really electric, and we did and we did a recording at Rudy Van Gelder's studio in Fort Lee, in oh, Jersey, Jersey, Jersey. Yeah. yeah, and it was like, it was wild, um, you know. Did it have uh, the secret sauce? I had the secret sauce, man. It has this uh -huh. crazy shit. And, and I don't know what it is because he wouldn't let us in the control room. You know, you can't <laughs> ask him any questions about the gear. But it was it was wild. Um, you know, uh, to, it was it's totally off the floor. You know, everybody's in the in the, in the live room. You know, nothing is edited. Nothing is punched, Great. you know. Um, and I just, you know, 10 years later, I just had this feeling of yeah, that was that was great, you know, and I, and I listen to it now and and and, and and you know, there's 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 uh, there's things I would change, you know, I, or maybe you know, maybe there's things that maybe I go shit. Had I had the option to kind of redo this, or punch, I, I would have. But um, there's a there's a there's a palpable energy in that recording, and it just is like it captures this very special group of people at a, at a particular time that that really um, yeah, really feels 
special to me, you know? And so that's a, that's a, that's a top five for sure. I'm going to go check that record out. What a great title. Yesterday you said tomorrow. Yeah. What a great, great title. Uh, and what would be the second one that came to mind? You know, um, I, I, I sort of in my own recording career, I've sort of been chasing this ghost that, that I had for that I, that I kind of feel like I caught on my first record called Woodwork. And I, it's just, it was just such a, uh, it was a really important session to me because I feel like it, it had been long delayed. I'd had this, I had a, I'd had a deal with, with Concord where we, you know, we'd done this super band called Next Collective and then everybody had an option to, to do a solo record and everybody had their option picked up but the timeline was really crazy and I was just dying to record. So I kind of forced my, it wasn't hard. I mean, they, they were happy to go, cool, do your thing, you know, but I, I extricated myself from that obligation and just went and recorded this, this album. And um, it was, you know, it was, it, it was about two or three years later than I had wanted to record it. And Wood, I, it was, was the woodwork record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I was so nervous to do it. And I felt like all this energy, nervous energy had been kind of pointed towards this thing, you know, because in, in the, in the, in like the, you know, quote unquote jazz world like the, you know the culture is very much like you know you play with all these other people and then you you know you make all these records with other people you tour with other people and then you do your own thing you know and then and, and yeah. that's sort of like and there's an enormous amount of weight put on that you know like what did, what is it that you have to say and, and et cetera et cetera and i um you know and and i was incredibly nervous to do that and we were at the clubhouse up in rhinebeck new york and it was a great band and we'd done some touring. We'd been to, we'd been to Europe, we'd been to Japan. We, you know, we'd done some stuff and as, 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 as your a, band, as my band, you know, wow, like okay. leading up to that recording. And, um, um, you know, and, and I, I, um, I was, I was like totally nervous. And I remember I just didn't sleep the night before they had this kind of guest house there and I just lay there, man. And I, I was just like, fuck, I hope this goes well. Fuck, I hope this goes well. You know, like I, like I put every dollar I had into it, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And, um, and, and it was one of those things that I just felt like, again, it's, it's just kind of, you know, each, as, you, as, as, as you're well aware, every, every session has its own sort of energy. Yeah. And, and it has to do with, you know, all kinds of factors, you know, from, I mean, you know, it's a laundry list of stuff, right? All these things converging and, at one time. And sometimes you don't even know what's like, I, I have people on the show and I think about this all the time. Like, why is there a certain energy with some people, but not with us, even though like we got along great, good questions, but like, you know, it, you know, it's like when you're dating, you know, oh man, you know, she's really good looking and like my top four out of five things but uh you can't manufacture that shit it's yeah. really fucking weird no yeah you can't and so i think that as musicians that those are the sessions that we like tend to sort of relive um that that stuff that feels like lightning in a bottle right like yeah it, or or what that you just kind of and so that session i mean I, I that session had that feeling to me where it was just like this it was a it was a um you know it was a uh you know a, a moving sports car that i just kind of hopped in the back of and it just carried me along you know and yeah. kind of and i feel like for like in a, by a, a lot of measurements i feel like uh it's the best uh, that's that's some of my best if not my best recorded playing you know in that in that it, it was they were just takes you know they were just they were live it was like you know there was no oh let me do that solo again let me let's punch this you know let's do this let's fix that it just it, all recorded live Basically, you know, ninety yeah. percent of it, and 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 um, again, like it, there's just there's just a palpable energy there for me that that I feel, you know, in, tuned in with, and um, so it's 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 some of those like some of those kinds of sessions are the ones that stick out to me, you know. Yeah. But also, each each you know each session has its own energy and, and thrust and as you know like records get made in different ways you know and and songs get written in different ways and like and and you know i think that as people we have a tendency to kind of value things kind of coming into being in one way over another and yeah whichever whatever your personal system is yeah you right. like it but yeah of course yeah but Definitely. I mean, I, i've tried to even move away from that like like you know like you know like when you're writing something like sometimes you know if, if it just kind of falls out of you you know, and you kind of, it happens in an hour, 
like we have a tendency to go, well, that's the real shit. That's that's somehow that's more, the real shit. You know, that's somehow like more true uh, than than this thing that I've been fucking slaving away for. You know, uh, uh, slaving away on for a month. You know, yeah. and like, and I don't know that that's how I feel. You know, I feel like um, they both have their their place. You know, and 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 one isn't better than the other. You know, because it kind of just fell off the tip of your tongue you know sure and so there are there are some records that you know that that have just been painstaking you know in terms of just like putting them together over time and, and like uh and is the result you know any any different in the end it's hard to, it's hard to say right and and they both and, yeah. and going through the process um it has its own they both have their own sort of you know energy and intrinsic value you know you learn you learn different things from from, from doing things in different ways you know so yeah, I think a lot. I think I have learned later in life. I wish I learned earlier that suffering and success are mutually exclusive. Right. Like you don't have to suffer to be successful. You know, you don't. And and because I was always the guy like I'm. You know, I'm gonna give 110 percent, and I still do, but I don't have to suffer. I just have to give 110 percent a little bit every day, yeah. and it'll work. You yeah. know, and and and. Uh, I wish I had learned that lesson earlier because I suffered through a lot of shit through self self ridiculous demands, not like anybody else, yeah. you know, and uh, you're right, though. The end result is the end result. You know? I'm, I'm struggling with that, too, man. You know, I struggle with that, too. Like, just yeah, just letting go of expectations or, or things having to go a certain kind of way, you know, yeah. or, or uh, yeah, it's a tough one, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is. The, I had a guy. uh that came on the show a long time ago, we became friends and he told me uh, something. He said, uh, don't be part of the results committee. Mm. I said, man, that is fantastic. Yeah. This way you do what you do and the results are what the results are, but don't be attached to that. If they're good, yeah. great. If they're not, you know, move on to your yeah. next adventure. Yeah. You know, what a, what a relief, right? If we could, if we can do that. Like, it has been an shit. amazing relief. I had to do it because I was mental yeah. and I was like, I needed to seriously. I just like, <laughs> yeah. I got to stop this man. Cause yeah. I'm, and I'm like so much happier, more easygoing person now. Um, cool. Yeah. I mean, it was like a number of changes I made, but that was one of them, like the suffering thing and the, you know what? I can control my end. I can't control. I'm not that powerful. Look, you yeah. know, there's a million reasons why things work and don't work, you know? Uh, and I just let it go. I was very lucky that he, it's just the way he said it. It was yeah. packaged. It was good marketing. You know, it was packaged right. <laughs> packaged <laughs> right. Man, don't be part yeah. of those company. Oh, I could do yeah. that. That's for sure, yeah. man. That's cool, uh, man. That's that's inspiring. I, I feel like I'm I feel like I am seeing the light, but I'm still in the midst of it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I listen, I'm learning time. every day. It's just, yeah. you know, sometimes things you learn when you're ready, sometimes, you know, you're not ready to learn it, you know. It's yeah. a, everybody's different. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure someone told me something similar 25 years ago. I wasn't <laughs> right, ready to right, exactly. Right. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, speaking of which, what were uh, what were some low points, Matt, or dark periods you've had to deal with, and how did you get through them? Yeah. Um, you know, definitely, um, like I said early on, definitely not getting accepted into the into the music school in Toronto. As a, in Toronto, you know, yeah. it really, it really. Um, yeah, that really it really fucked with me, man. It really it really um, uh, it's it, it 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 was tough. I sort of thought, well, shit, what's my path forward in music here? You know, like what am, yeah. I, what am I what am I going to do? And I mean, that seems it's it seems ridiculous in hindsight, and also kind of wimpy in hindsight. And I think I would have gotten over it, you know, and and, yeah. and and moved ahead. But that was tough on me, and I and it really um, not only just not getting in having a, my best friend did get in that was tough uh, and you're a hell <laughs> of a also, player man too i mean your command of you know your your emotional and intellectual command of music is pretty strong well so i thanks. could understand why you would have been frustrated i you know i i don't even know that i felt like i i should have i just felt like i didn't and i it was just a feeling of rejection i think and i think um and i think it it, it sort of played into my just my identity as a person too because i've always felt um you know, I've always sort of struggled with, you know, what, uh, not not who not who am I, but but what does it mean to be where I'm from? You know, like right. what what is it what is it what is it to be a Canadian per like what is what is that identity? You know, yeah. And 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 I always sort of felt um, 
like I didn't fit fit in there, you know, in, yeah, in, yeah. In, into that culture. And um, and and so that stung, you know, another one, you know, but I, but there's been but there's been lots, man. I feel like I've gosh, I mean, I um, another one was I was hinting at that that thing with Concord, you know, like I, I made all these records for Concord as a side person, you know, and I had a really de developed a really close relationship with with an A&R person there. And, you know, and, you know, and, and it really so there was many, many years where it was like, this is going to be the, this is going to be where I put my first record out. This is going to be the thing that puts me on a map on the map. And when that finally kind of came to be, it was always with a sort of a caveat, you know, it was like, well, we're going to, we're going to sign you. Okay. Now we're going to, all right, now here's the contract. We're actually going to sign you, but you got to do this collective band first. And, and, you know, like here's, it's, you know, it's with these five guys and, and, and this is like a thing that's going to come out ahead of everybody's individual record and we'll market this and that'll give everybody more of an individual audience, you know? So that happened. And then it was, okay, great. Can I do my record now? Yeah. Yeah. But not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Oh, and then, you know, and, oh, it's going to be in two months. Now, oh, no, we have to do it in a year. Oh, no, two years, that kind of thing. And so it got to this wow. point where I was sort of in my early 30s, and I was like, shit, I haven't made a record yet. I really, I've been ready to make a record for, for five years, and I haven't had a chance. I've been sort of waiting for this thing. And, uh, um, and you know, that was a major, that was a major disappointment, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I, had, I really had it in my mind that I was going to, um, you know, so, like that I was going to put out records for this, for, for a major jazz label, you know, yeah. and that took me and then kind of pivoting to, to sort of essentially go it alone, you know, at least at first was a, you know, that took a lot of, uh, yeah, that took a lot. Um, that was, that was hard on me. You know, my wife helped me through that a lot. You know, um, she, uh, you know, my father-in-law lent me, uh, lent me five grand to, you know, towards making that album. Make it would have come out of this, you know, to, it would have come out of this, you know, it would have been part of this Concord budget, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, like I had some, I had some help and I had a lot of support and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, I think that in a lot of ways, what helped me through that was just, you know, like, you know, my peer group and, and kind of like really like investing, reinvesting in, in all the people, all the unbelievable musicians who, who, who I know who are, you know, we're all in this shit together. You know? Yeah. And it's like, we're all like, despite how it may look from, you know, from the outside or, or whatever, like we're all just down in the, in the fucking muck, man. Like, yeah. Just, you know, um, just um, not fighting it out, but just, uh, just trying to make it happen, you know? Just yeah. Yeah. To, like just trying to, just trying to continue to give ourselves the time and resources to do, to do what we love to do, you know? So I think I found a lot of like, um, uh, motivation and uh, strength in like, a, you know, in a communal struggle, you know, after yeah. kind of going, well, okay, cool, big deal. I'm not going to be one of the, you know, 3% of people who are sort of plucked out of this thing and given a major label deal, you know, great. Now, I'm, you know, I don't even have to worry about that. I won't even deal with that. I'll just kind of like, uh, I'll get down here with my compatriots here and, and, and make, make a record. Yeah. You know, hindsight 2020. If that ha how would you have handled that if that happened today? Like, what did you learn out of that? I think I would have just gotten it, gotten over it a lot quicker. As you, as you were saying, I think I would have, you know, I've had, I've had disappointments since then, certainly, you know? Yeah. And I think I would have just dusted myself off a lot quicker and, and, right. kind, of, and kind of carried on. Um, I think I, I spent a lot of time torturing myself about yeah. that and going, well, it must be me, right? Like it's clearly I'm just not clearly I'm just not good enough, right? Like 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 they if I was a good enough musician, they would have done, they would have yeah. picked up this option sooner and they would have done this. So so you know um, I think I think it's a partially not I wouldn't have let them define me for myself as much, right? Right? Because right, right. you're because you're going oh shit the, if you know if I was really worth myself, they would have done this. So I must not be you know I must not be I must be you know somehow you know, inferior or, or, or not as good as I think I am or whatever it is, you know? And so, and, and I think I would have just, yeah, not let them control the narrative in my own mind about you know, in your own, Yeah. I give up. Yeah. What I actually meant was what, if, if, <laughs> Sorry. no, that was, I, I wanted you to go through that because it was good to hear that. But what I meant was 
because I'm thinking there's other people listening to this who might be in this situation where you get hooked up with a record company and they're dangling the fucking carrot over your head and like, yeah, just jump a little higher. You know, mm -hmm. if you were in that situation again, what would you have done? Not where they didn't make the record, but like, would you have continued going on? Like, what would you, if you could even answer that, you might be able to answer it. Well, you know, per our, uh, you know, the, our, what we were what we were talking about, Shark Tank. You know, yeah. just a couple minutes ago. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't no. know. I I think that I I think I could really argue it both ways because I think the the you know hindsight being twenty twenty, I think that one thing that I was immature about was that I felt like, um, you know, they were they wanted to put out this record that I had done bef like that it, that I'd recorded independently, and they wanted that to be the first record that I released, and I felt to myself. Oh, that's old to me now. I don't want to do this, you know. Like, yeah. I want to do something new that feels like you know, like it's on the bleeding edge of where I'm at, and it feels hyper relevant uh, okay. to me. Um. So sometimes, you know, I think that I might say that to to my younger self, be patient. Like, like, like at this point, like just because this doesn't feel, just because this is two years old, yeah, yeah, to you and feels like it's totally irrelevant. It doesn't make it any any less worthy of being out in the world, or that it or 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 diminish its potential impact for others. Yes. You know? Yeah. Okay. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So I might yeah. have been a little hasty in that regard. You know. I totally get it. Yeah. Well, if you're the way you are, Type A, you're always going to be like, you know, pushing yourself to do better and better. And so you normally think, well, I had this much experience then, so right. I could do this, and if I have this much experience now, I could do this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that, man. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. That was really cool. Um, okay. Your new record, Pittsburgh. Uh, is that the first record in the history of records that Pittsburgh's had named after them? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. However, I don't know. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I, was, I was toying with titles. It kind of came down to what am I going to call this Pittsburgh or Al, or Allegheny, which is the county. And I thought, man, right. Allegheny is just too flowery, man. I'm just going to I'm not I'm not going to make any attempt at being Allegheny, at all poetic. Yeah. I'm just going to call it what it is. You know, isn't there a place? It's not it's not it's in eastern Pennsylvania called Altoona. You ever heard of that? Yes, I do know. Altoona, Altoona Pennsylvania. Yeah, I was yeah. there once. It's hilarious. Yeah, that's sort of headed towards State College. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so, man, you got this is your uh, you have five albums out now. This is a pretty big catalog. Well, so I think this this will be my fifth. So I have two I have um, two totally solo records mm -hmm. and then two with Walter that are right. co-led. And then this will be my fifth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, that's that's right. a so big far. catalog, man. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I, I feel like uh, I, I have a you know, I got a burning to, to just kind of to record a lot these days you know i just really want to do it man it's like it's i just want to make i don't know now that now that i now that i've you know i've, I've kind of started the, the 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 thing i'm just kind of like let's just keep going <laughs> it's 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 a it's a great record and um you know there's a lot involved in doing this and you know i think you need a, a fair amount of drive to put a lot of records out and you definitely have it um i'm trying to I thank God I wrote the tunes down that You're I like because I, I can't for some reason the web page is dead. But for me, uh, you have two tracks on there I really like: "Buckets" yeah. and "Foreign Ghosts." Oh, cool! Can you maybe talk about those tracks? The yeah. backstory to them, or yeah, um, you know, there's, there's they all sort of have the same. That collection of music all sort of has the same, but like the same kind of genesis, you know, like yeah. a, like or origin story. Um, which is that, you know, it kind of ties back into what we were talking about earlier about just trying to find your own way to sort of be be present and be, you know, in like, a, I don't know, for lack of a better term, you know, let people know what you're doing, or promote yourself, set, yeah. whatever, you know, be, uh, you know, a trumpet your own cause, so to speak, right? And I was yeah. thinking to myself, like, you know, much like people have their own way of being on the bandstand as a band leader, you know, people have their own way of, of engaging on social media platforms, you know? Totally. And I was thinking like, man, what can I do that's going to feel true to me? You know, like, like I don't want to just bow out. I don't feel like I have the luxury of just bowing out, you know? Yes. I would like to. I, I feel like I can't, <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, on social media? I know. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, I, but I, I want to, I, I, 
you know, half half out of interest, half out of obligation, I'm going to participate. How can I do this in a way that, like, what do I do often that feels, that would feel good to me or feel somehow true, you know? Um, like, are you saying that putting a picture of your dinner is not true? <laughs> exactly. That's not, I'm saying that that's not my truth. <laughs> you know what? I don't, I, people do that and I want to yeah. fucking send them a bill. I know. <laughs> for the fucking six seconds of my life that I wasted yeah, on yeah, their, you know, yeah. tacos. I know. Like, why do you do that? Why? I I, nobody, I nobody. Re I mean, do you think somewhere out there, somebody's like one of your followers said, man, I'm so happy to know that, you know, Matt had a great meal on Tuesday, on Monday, June 28th. You know, like, I, know. I mean, what is going through your fucking mind? Man? I know. It's one of the great mysteries of the world, man. I yeah. don't fucking know. I, I, you know, but I, I was thinking like, okay, well, you know, anyone who's here, you know, is not here to listen to me talk about my, you know, my dinner or my political views or my, you know, or, or whatever. They're here because they're interested in my guitar playing. You know, yeah. it's, it's basically that simple. So right. m m more or less. So what can I offer that is along those lines? I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that's just going to play as fast as I can for 10 seconds. And you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just kind of, I'm also, I also don't really, I also don't really have like a, I wasn't taking an educational slant per se, you know, I wasn't going to, so I was just like, what can I do? And I, and I thought, well, Hey man, this is an opportunity. Maybe I'll work on like some little, in my mind, they were, I was just calling them guitar minis, you know, I was like, yeah. well, I just work on some short pieces that are just these little statements, you know, um, that are just solo guitar things, you know, and I'll, and I love playing this little Martin and I'll just kind of roll with that, see what I come up with. Sure. And so the majority of those pieces are all just, exp uh, you know, an expansion of these 20 to 40 second guitar minis that I, I started kind of just writing as, as, as something to share on Instagram, you know? And so this was like a, not, it wasn't like, let me make an album. Let me, it was, it came out of you. Like you had enough of these and you're like, Hey, I like some of these things. Let me put a record together. Well, basically. So it was, it was a combination of, of, of a couple of things. That was one factor. The other factor, it sort of collided with the fact that we were all dealing with this pandemic. And I basically just got sick of practicing meaning yeah. like, like, like technic, you know, like, and I was like, you know, I, I, I miss, I miss practicing. Uh, I miss the exercise of performing music, which oh is, which in, which in of itself is a practice, right? Like you have to, pr you have to practice performing, you know, like, or uh, totally the performance of a piece. And so I wasn't doing that with anyone. Right. And I was only, and I, and I thought, well, I'll, I guess I'll just have to do that alone as well. Right. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, and I, and, um, and I thought that shit, well, you know, these are some good, good starts, you know, and I got this little, this little tiny commission from a place in New York called the jazz gallery to do some stuff. And I, to do a few pieces. And I thought, well, why don't I just do some of this solo music, you know? And it kind of, and I just liked how it came out. And my friend Eric was like, man, this sounds really great. You should, um, you know, you should just keep rolling with this. See, you know, it's like, not like you don't have the time or the, or the, yeah. the source material. And then that, you know, so there were those two things. And then, and then I, in November, right before Thanksgiving, I fractured my elbow. Holy I, fell off a, crap. I fell off my bike. That's and gotta be painful as hell, it was, no? It was very painful. Oh, and man. I fractured my outer radial and I and I was in this you know it was fucking it was terrible. Right? It was like, we were like in a the, cast? I wasn't in a cast because they didn't have to do surgery. I was in a sling. But my my aunt is a physical therapist and she was like, oh. you know, just start you know, I know you can't like you know, do much of anything, you know, you can't lift your kid up or lift a, even a fucking shopping bag, but you know, but you can, if you can play, you're not going to hurt yourself. So go right. ahead and play. Um, and you Holy know, shit. That's and so I just thought to myself, man, like, all right, well, you know, being, you've, you've kind of, you've got me pegged, you know, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a type A. And so like what my, and I'm also a little bit obsessive and I feel like what I, I, I could have easily fell into this thing of being like, can I still play as well as I could before? Oh shit. Am I, am I losing some of my proficiency here? Like I could just kind of go down this crazy wormhole of like, <laughs> of like trying to, you know, make sure I could, I'm not losing any of my facility or something like that. Or, you know, or I could just take this, this, this material that requires like almost, um, like almost a, a classical level level of, of, of repetition and practice yes. in order to like get it inside of myself and, and to, to, to perform it in any kind of a way that sounds like music. Um, and I, that could be what I do to kind of rehabilitate myself here. And so it became like this, 
this great thing for me to kind of sink all my energy into because it was like it was repetitive but also like slow and deliberate and like it was forcing me to you know focus on things like dynamics and and and, mm. and you know and sound production so it's like a like healing that. record for you kind of it is like a healing yeah. record for me you know that's it, great it, you know so it, it gave me and it gave me like a it gave me a purpose you know it gave me yes. something to focus on which people and, needed during the pandemic for yeah, sure. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And so it was that for me, um, rather than just like a crazy spiral of, can I still play guitar? You know, it was like, that's really cool, man. It's hard to name instrumental songs. Do you have any like particular things that, you, you know, isn't it like, how do you, it is, it is really hard. You know, I usually what I do, and this is like totally unglamorous and not, and, uh, uh, but I, I have like a running list of, of titles that I like, you know, words that I like saying great. Like. And then whenever I write music, it's just, I never name them or rarely name them. Like 80% of the time I don't name them. And then I just play like do matchmaking at the end. Oh, you said this sounds like this. Exactly. That's pretty smart actually. Yeah. 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 That's that sort smart. of what I kind of just kind of, yeah. It's, I just sort of, you know, pour myself a drink and enjoy, I enjoy that process. If I have a good list, but it's fun. You know, if you have like a good list of titles and a good, and a, you know, good, you know, a bunch of songs that you like. Yeah, that thing is pretty smart, actually, because otherwise you got to sit and what the hell you call this song. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Um, this is pretty different from your other records in that it was solo acoustic. My question is, but now I know why. It's because you broke, you had this thing with the, you started on Instagram. And th how yeah. long did that take? To, is that all healed up now? Basically, I am still, I still have like, I'm still lacking some of my, my range of motion, but basically I'm good. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Should be. Should be, should be a hundred percent by the end of the year, you know. Um, did you mix the record? Because I listened to it um, over earbuds when I was walking, and man, it's the mix is really fucking great. Oh, I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy with that mix. I didn't. So it's a guy in Pittsburgh. Actually, I recorded it at a, you know, I, a, after doing that thing for the jazz gallery, it became. Like I became acutely aware of the fact that like this is not the kind of record that I can record in my basement. You know what I mean with it? With a well, you, you know, can. One, but... I can. You know what I mean? With it, I wasn't. I was like. You I can't expect gonna... much sonically, but you it, can. It, it, exactly. I was like. I was like, man, this is gonna live or die on you know just like the nuance of this instrument being felt and heard. You know, in a certain yeah. kind of way. And I wasn't gonna be able to do that myself. And so I went. There was. There's only a couple studios that I'm aware of in town at all. And so. Mm. I got a recommendation from a friend and I went and uh, this guy, Jay Dutt, and I did, we just hit it off, man. And like, and uh, so he recorded it and, and mixed and mastered it for me. You know? he, did the, he did the whole thing, man. And he's just like, he's one of these guys, you know, he's just like, he's won a bunch of Grammys, but you know, if you, you know, like you look at his resume and it all makes sense, but, but I was, right. I was unaware of him, you know, yeah. and I, and, and he was just like the coolest guy to work with incredibly, you know, uh, easy to be around, which was important because it was just me. You know what I mean? Like I'm just, it's, it, it's a vulnerable record. You know, it's you it's and an acoustic guitar. Exactly. It's like, yeah. you know, you, you can't yeah. hide mistakes on acoustics either, you know, or, yeah. or you sound yeah. like you got, yeah. And, you know, and he was patient and, you know, it wasn't, cut, you know, I never felt like he, you know, he was just, he was his, his whole kind of, uh, vibe was, was very supportive. You know? So I, I he just was really probably thrilled doing. because it's pandemic. Right. You know, I'm serious. Right, it's not exactly. like he's just slammed with people right, making right, records now, right, you know, exactly. that's great. So, yeah. I thought the mix, the mic placement, it was just, you know, I'm so glad. It, it was really, really good. I don't often oh. ask a question about the mix, Yeah, but it was yeah. really cool. I'm know? so glad. Yeah. It was, I mean, you know, it was, he, it, I, I really got to just, it's all Jay, you know, but it was just, it was, it was, it, it is amazing. And, and I, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with how 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 beautifully he mixed it because it's just it's just uh, it's just so important for a record like that. Man. Yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, the record before that called Preverbal, and I yeah. kept looking at it, I kept saying proverbial. No, all right, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, it's pre. What did, I gotta ask you? What is that? Is that like? I mean, is it literally before you could speak or? No, the the the, the title comes from this idea that like because I you know maybe maybe kind of tipped you off a little bit that I, that I sort of connect these, you know, I connect titles with music after the fact. Like I don't, yeah. I sort of think of often think of music as, um, 
you know, it's, it's like it's entirely own thing, you know, and I don't relate it back to, um, I often I don't naturally relate it back to words or even colors or, you know, or even, even ideas that I could put into a sent like a, a, a verbal sentence, you know, so, so the idea was, with the title was, was that I, I've always, for me, it's always, music has kind of always existed as it's, as it's, um, it, like in a totally autonomous way where, where, where everything, you know, like everything is kind of present within that form itself. And, and, you know, I, I, I haven't often felt compelled to draw uh, a line back to our spoken language, you know, so you, you'd be comfortable like calling the, making an album and calling it one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay. I, I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. Instrumental yeah. music, man. It's, it, it's not, I totally get it, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason I don't is because I've tried to do it twice and both times the label's been like, uh -uh. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it's like, um, so, which I, which I totally understand, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I would be, I would be comfortable doing that. What is the biggest difference in where you were like musically and headspace wise between pre-verbal and Pittsburgh? <sighs> you know, I think they're both just really um, products of um, like their time and place. So for me, I felt with like when I recorded Preverbal, I, I'd been working really closely on this with Esperanza and Tony on this on this D Plus Evolution record, and I felt like, and I'd just been doing a lot of sessions, and I felt like I was really um, creative in the studio with other people's music <laughs> mm. I felt like like I felt like when I was working on someone else's record I was like oh let's do this let's try this let me just let's get this kind of a sound let's do this like I was just like you know I was like you know like, like an octopus just like you know like I really I was just really um felt comfortable like just exercising that 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 muscle of, of, of using the studio as an instrument you know mm -hmm. and just and um and I felt gosh but I don't you know why don't I ever want to do that? Excuse me. Why don't I ever want to do that on my own music? You know, like why don't I? Why 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 don't I bring that sort of same kind of, you know, kind of caution to the wind, kind of sonic creative energy to my own recordings? And that's know? interesting that you say that. Yeah, that's. Um, so that was sort of the, the impetus for that. I was just like, you know what? I don't. I'm not going to worry about where this record is going to fit in. In like or in terms of you know, I, I never give a shit about that. But of course, you know, people are like, well. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not rock enough for rock. It's not jazz enough for jazz or whatever. You know what I mean? Or what is this? That's like, their problem, to, man. Their not, you know, yeah. That's so, trying to change, change the channel, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I, so, but so for me, I, I, I just put all that entirely out of my head on that record. And, and, um, and, you know, I didn't think, oh, where are we going to, where are we going to tour this? Where are we gonna? I just was like, let me just, let me just follow my nose here, you know? That's and, I had a, and I had a studio in, in Brooklyn at the time and, and we recorded a lot of it there, you know, and did a lot of demos of the stuff there, did a lot of post-production there, and a lot of pre-production there, too. And so, um, and I produced it with my friend Eric, you know, who did a lot of the production work with me. And, um, uh, yeah, it was like, it was a nightmare to perform live, but making the record was super fun, you know? That's cool. Uh, so, and then, yeah, and then I think that here I am, whatever, three, three or four years later, and... Um, it was just the it was just the circumstance of this of this of of being you know uh being home and and, and breaking my arm and and and, and all those and the, and the you know and the confluence of all those other factors that i mentioned earlier and also just i you know also i just love that instrument so much it was like i i right before the pandemic i did a couple of shows in the house band for that for chris Thiele's show that lot he took over you know, Prairie Home Companion and did live from here, you know? Okay, and, yeah. Uh, and so I did a couple big things in the house band and I showed up for the first one and I just had this Larave guitar that I had when I was a teenager, you know? And I basically like got laughed out of the room. It was like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, because they're all, they're all these guys with these beautiful, you know, they're all bluegrass players, right? And so they have these unbelievably beautiful old, you know, yeah, yeah. instruments, you know? And I was like, oh man, well, if I'm going to do this show, even more than once or they even even like some semi regularity like you know and, and want to be <laughs> taken seriously i better get myself with it was a cool excuse to get to go guitar shopping to, yeah know? yeah and, right. and 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 so 
I played one of these old Martins uh, at a studio um, in LA called NRG a few times, and I, it just really suited me and suited the way that I play, and I liked it. And I kind of went on a hunt for, on a hunt for one, and yeah, and so I, I got it like sort of like November of 2019. So it, it was like very new, and so all through 2020, it was like. I was just like so excited to have this guitar, you know, itself. Yeah, so it was really the instrument itself too. I just like was like so into playing it, you know. Where'd you wind up buying it? Uh, at a place called Retro Fret in Brooklyn. Okay. They they just they just sell you know, yeah they're like a, a boutiquey you know all, sure. only v- vintage instruments kind of thing. So it was the most money I've ever spent on a guitar. It's a it's a fifty six. That sounds loan, beautiful, you know? man. Yeah, you know, and and so you I was just it. so inspired. Exactly. <laughs> you know, can you get, need can it. Can I get my wife? Can you tell? Can you tell Katie? That? You know, you needed it. I know you needed it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. So yeah. So it was just it was just inspiring. I just found myself just wanting to pick that guitar up on yeah. a daily basis. You know. Cool. Well, it sounds great, man. Thanks, man. Um, is that your go-to guitar right now, acoustically? Acoustically, that's my only acoustic guitar. Yeah. So I have so- that. That's it. Tell me, uh, electric. What's your go-to right now? What are the top three? Yeah, so I had a, um, I had a, I was playing these guitars called Mulan that were made by a guy in, in South Korea. They were really cool. Tim yeah. Lafay, the bass player, hooked me up with them. I know Tim. Ago. He was on the. Yeah. Show. He's awesome. Yeah. That guy. Tim's the man. He's and so cool. He he's knows great. everybody. He knows everybody. He Tim knows is, Tim everybody. Is the, yeah, man. He's the he's the president of the musicians, whatever. Yeah, he is man. Do you smoke cigars? Yes, I do smoke cigars. So do I. That's so funny. Because we spent time talking about cigars. There you go. Like, I was like, okay, well, try this one. Try that. <laughs> That's so funny, man. He's giving so, me some advice on that too. Like, but uh, but he hooked me up with this company called Mulan, and like, uh, they've been great. And I played one of these one of these tellies for a long time. But basically, like, the, I, the neck needs to be like heat pressed. It's just it's twisted. It's all fucked up, and so, and I couldn't get to. I couldn't get it done by anyone that I knew or trusted, you know, during the yeah. pandemic. And so I, um, uh, a friend of my, uh, the, my, my rep, I, I, I have a, I have a, uh, a endorsement with Vox. And, and so, and my, the guy who I work with at Vox was very kind, uh, to, to put me in touch with a guy at Fender, you know, and they, oh, and that's they, great. And they, and I was thinking, what should I get, man? And I, and they, they, um, I got one of these, uh, they sent me one of these, the, the 70th anniversary broadcaster. They were just making them last last year. That's year. cool. It was cool. So I've just kind of sort of been what I've had for a year. And so I've been playing that the last year since my other one has sort of been in, in disrepair. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's like a lot spankier than the other one. It's, it's a, but I just, I just, I, I just made a record with it two weeks ago. I just did another Resperanza record these last two weeks. I played that guitar. It's cool. It's like, it's a, you know, it's, it's like, the, you know, Maple Neck and a, ash body you know right and actually fender's not making ash body guitars anymore so i got one of the last ones man oh that's great man yeah so it's cool that's i've been you know i've been happy with it it's like um yeah i've been I've, that's sort of been i anyways i've been playing telly for, since about since about 2014 you know okay so you, so that's that's primarily what you play now tellies yeah yeah okay that's so funny that you know tim so you must know donnie i know donnie i know all those yeah, guys yeah that's so funny <laughs> that is that's hilarious man mm-hmm. um favorite no tell me the last song or last thing you listen to musically oh man okay um and you can look at your phone if or your ipod or whatever if you need to no I'm, yeah let me take a quick little look because <laughs> i wouldn't know good. yeah yeah can you tell me oh the last thing i listened to okay what was um i'm gonna just tell the truth here and not like make up some cool thing that i want you to say um the <laughs> last thing i listened to was uh uh, Nat King Cole, those lazy, hazy days of summer, oh, because cool. uh, because we're I um, this is uh, I'm doing a working on a, on a on a version for my publisher of that with this great singer from England called Anna B. Savage, and if you don't know her, you should definitely check her out. Yeah, she's why do I know her? her? She's kind of she's got a little thing going on now. She um she just put out her first record on City Slang, and she's a really cool guitar player and an unbelievable singer great writer she's really special so i'll check her out I check her I've out for sure name. so yeah i've been kind of spending some time with with that that song um just to we're trying to figure out how we're going to kind of put a spin on it <laughs> yeah do you have like a worst gig ever story i got a few man 
<laughs> okay, here's one. Here's here's one that sticks up. So so <laughs> maybe around 2010 or 2011, um, I was subbing for Jonathan Kreisberg in, with Dr. Lonnie Smith, you know, uh-huh. and. Um, and we were playing this one-off. I was playing the first gig of this European tour with with Lonnie. It was in the it was in Portugal in the Azu- in the Azores, and and I'd gone to Lonnie's house a couple times. Oh, he lives there. Um, no, he lives in Harlem. But I got okay. where I where I live, and I gone a couple. He goes. He's actually between Florida and 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 okay. Um, and I'd gone to his place a couple times to like work on songs, you know, and uh, to work on his songs. But he's he's just the best. Like he's an unbelievable musician and hysterical. And but you know, I think it would probably take some time to kind of get comfy in his in his band because, you know, he just he's real old school. Like you know, there's no charts, which is totally cool. But he, um, you know, he also is like, you know, he's sort of he's he's self-taught, right? And he, it's, his ears are unbelievable. So, but he can't, you know, he's not going to speak to you in like a language that's like oh yeah no you just go to c7 on the bridge or whatever it's not that he's like yeah it's like, this kind of thing i don't know you know it's sort of this sound and so um and he has like and i was like lonnie what are we going to play you know and he was just like well just you know just learn all my just learn all my records <laughs> learn you know? my and catalog like, like. yeah and he's got like you know, exactly he's got like an enormous catalog yeah. right and so i'm kind of going through them and, you know a lot of them are like shorter tunes and so i kind of feel like i have them you know but he also still man you need some guidance like you know get, throw me a bone give me five songs that you'll definitely play you know whatever exactly, exactly <laughs> you know and and he could he's the, like he could say that he'd go like okay he'd answer you but then it just doesn't mean anything you know he's yeah. gonna forget that he told you that and it's not gonna he's gonna oh, go play whatever you know that's and the other thing game. that happens is that he gets he gets the he always like forgets the titles of shit too so he'll be like you know it's this one and it's like He'll call it, you know, it's like it's it's this song of his, but he'll call it by another title and it's off a different record. It's that kind of thing, you know. And he's like, and then he also likes to play some standards too, but you know, um, but he'll like sometimes he knows so many tunes that like you know he'll play some standard, and then sometimes he'll like mix up like he'll play like you know the A section of some standard, and then for the bridge he'll go to like the bridge of like a different but similar sounding standard, you know, like that that kind of thing, you know. Um, that's he's a worst so, gig ever story right there. You don't have to go any further, man. Just I, don't, so, I don't know if there's so, a punchline, but that's... He's, he's just so free with it, man. I mean, man, but I mean, there's guys like, I mean, you know, Peter Bernstein is like, you know, has, has been handling that masterfully, you know what I mean, for, yeah. for years. Anyways, I was I was pretty young at the time still, and I and I was like really excited to be playing with him, you know? Yeah, of course. And I learned all this shit, and I, you know, and I was probably a lot more rigid than I am now being like, right, well, I need to know what we're going to play, and what are we going to, you know, and he was just like, oh, don't worry about it. And so I felt like I knew everything. And we showed up at this gig, man, and and he started playing this song. And I, man, I, I literally learned like 60 songs. Or I thought I had, you know? And he goes, starts playing this song, and I'm just like, it's the first song, and I'm like, I have no fucking idea what this song is. <laughs> I have no idea. And it basically just went on like that for like 90 minutes. Oh, you know? my God. And, and I think he probably, you know, I think... I don't even remember how, like, you know, he, he played, you know, whatever, 15 songs. And I think I probably knew about two of them. And the rest of the time was just like a full, full blackout experience, you know, of me just being like, what the fuck am I doing oh, right now? God. Like, just like, I have no recollection of it. It was that stressful, you know, <laughs> it was just like, yeah, yeah. Like you forced it out of your mind. Exactly, yeah. You know, wow. That is a, that is a nightmare gig. Yeah, it was. And it was and it was made all all the worse by the fact that I was like you know I sort of it was like you know someone that I really really wanted to play with <laughs> it wasn't like you know ugh. was how many how many gigs did you do with him I just did that one and then I did a couple more subbing gigs for Jonathan you know within like subsequent years when he still had that band so it's yeah. like it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, I guess I guess maybe he didn't notice it he didn't think it was as bad as I as I did you know wow. Well, that's cool, man. Yeah. Which is important. Yeah. Uh, give me your top three Desert Island discs, just for this minute. For this minute, um, I, okay. Um, for this minute, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave without um, Miles Davis four and more. Um, I also, I wouldn't leave without. Right now, I would have to bring um, Daniel Lanois, Akadi, Akadi, with me for sure. 
<laughs> and um, God, and then maybe, you know, and then I would have to say, gosh, Des Ryan right now, Pat Metheny, Trio 99-2000. I love that record. Man, that's like very representative of your playing. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Uh, tell me one thing, Matt, that you're either proudest of or most grateful for doing or not doing, both in, in one in your professional life, one in your personal life. Um, yeah, I'm, I think in my professional life, I'm, I'm, I think I'm most proud of, uh, just kind of, uh, well, gosh, I think the best way to put it is just that I know that I will continue to see this through, you know, I think I have some stay, I think my, my, <laughs> I think my, my magic power will be, uh, you know, in, in longevity, you know, just, I just, I, it, I gotta do it. I, I, uh. It, it, it's what gives me the most joy and uh, you know, and I, and I've been through lots of ups and downs like we all have. And, uh, sure. Not for a moment. Have I really felt like I would walk away from it? You know, I think That's I'm proud nice. Of that. Yeah. Thank you. That is something to be proud of. And personal life. I think in my personal life, I, I think that I, you know, I'm still married <laughs> to, you know what I mean? <laughs> still married <laughs> to, to the person yeah. you first got married to. That's exactly. pretty I'm still cool. married to my first, my first and hopefully only wife. And, yeah, man. Uh, you know, and I have a good relationship with my son, you know, and That's I think nice. so, so, um, I think, so I think that sort of finding what feels like some, some balance between that and, and, you know, a lot of time away from home. Uh, That's cool, man. Something that I, you know, certainly don't take for granted. Pretty, Thank you. Yeah. So similar question. Uh, what do you like most about yourself? Wow. Um, I think I'm able to, uh, I think I'm generally, uh, like, a, like, I think I'm generally an optimist, you know, um, I, no matter how hard I try to not be, you know, no matter how bleak it gets. Exactly. Yeah. I think I just have a natural, optimism you know yeah that's that great served me well man it serves everybody well when you're around yeah. when you're around an optimistic person man i'll tell yeah. you it's, it's yeah. like so toxic being around someone who's the opposite for me anyway I'm yeah like, me too and i'm not good with hiding that yeah i'll just like shut up and like totally. just walk away as quickly as i can totally. most important thing your dad taught you god I think to be to be kind to others, and also to 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 be there for your kids. You know, he was there for you guys. He was there for us, man. He was yeah. always there for us. And your mom, most important thing she taught you? She always has an amazing ability to give people the benefit of the doubt. She never, um, yeah. She she's she's the least judgmental person I know, and. Um, yeah, it, it's she's pretty amazing that, that way. Yeah, I'd say that she's just incredibly non-judgmental and and always assumes, you know. Your folks are still up in Toronto. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> they are. They're in the the area. They they they're both retired and they they moved to like the Canadian side of uh, Niagara Falls. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's beautiful up there. It's just so freaking yeah. cold, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. But do you, do you you don't mind cold weather, or do you? No, I like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any hobbies, Matt, outside of music? I've gotten way into riding a bike, man. I've gotten even despite oh. having broken my arm. Yeah, it's been great. Do you ride with Tim? He he, he does ride, he ride I think. all the you time? I think so. He's in L.A. So we like I kind of got to know him better once he was no longer in New York. So, but, uh, so, oh, but okay. I, I'll keep that in mind. We're 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 actually in touch a lot right now. We're, we're working on a new um, a new quartet, like a new band with um. We're going to record in January with Corey Fineville from Butcher Brown and Aaron Parks too. So That's we'll great, gonna, man. Yeah, it'll be That's fun. really cool. I think he's actually in Arizona, maybe. Oh even. shit! Okay, I think so. I think I'm not. Don't. I'm, I think I'm you might be sure. right. That's ringing a bell. Yeah. But he rides all the time. So we were talking cool. about that. Uh, favorite place you traveled? You've been all over. Oh man. You know, I love. I love. Honestly, I really love going to Italy. I just, it's just unbelievable. That's on the top there. ten for musicians. Yeah, I've gotten to go there a lot. 
and I just I, I have such a great time. What's your, what's your since we're talking about Italy? What's your favorite New York City food? Oh, I'd say Mexican food, man. To be honest, really. All right, yeah. so give me a good Mexican place to go in the city. There are so many, you know, like um, uh, El. Uh, Ilbira is a really good one. It's a specific kind of um, tacos that like centers around like a shredded beef thing, kind of like, um, kind of like a Ropa Vieja, but it's but it's not you know Venezuelan food. Um, it's it's a taco from a particular region in Mexico that I can't remember. I maybe oh, I maybe Guadalajara. I can't remember. Anyway, that's a great place. There's a great taco truck in Sunset Park called Tacos El Bronco, which is unbelievable, man. That's in Queens, right? It. Sunset Park. Or was that in Brooklyn? Uh, that's in Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah, Sunset Park, yeah. You know, there's just so many. They're just like. Do you know any so places many. in the city? Yeah. Um, there's one that I really, really like. Oh, Elbira, uh, Elbira is is in the city. It's in the Lower East Side. Okay. Um, that one's. There's one. There's a. There's actually a truck in Queens, and then there's the, the a storefront one in the Lower East Side, which is great. Yeah. E L B I R A. B I E R R B I E R R A. Okay, Biera. Okay. Biera. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, man. I always go to one in the West, not in the West Village, just like just in off off Washington Square Park. It's it's, it's pricey, but the food is good. Um, again, a brain fart. Yeah. <laughs> no sweat. Um, toughest decision you've ever had to make. Ooh. Well, it's funny. It felt tough at the time. Like I took, I took about six months off totally when my son was born. Um, wow. That felt, that's like a cool. really, that felt like a really tough decision, but in hindsight, it doesn't feel like it was tough <laughs> or rather, you know, it, it feels like a, like a, in hindsight, it feels like it would, it, it, it should have been obvious, you know, or something, but wow. I give yeah. you credit. That must, you can never get that time back. No, no. I wish I had done that. That's amazing. Yeah. It was cool, man. I'm really glad I did. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That's really good, man. Uh, just a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, most important lesson life has taught you? I think, I, I mean, I can only answer in this moment. And I think that that would be, uh, you know, it's um, in line with, uh, you know, Anyone who's ever done a ten-step program, or, you know, maybe we'll, uh, twelve-step program, 12, sorry, twelve-step yeah. program, we'll, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, it'll resonate with them. Just, just to, I think, just recognizing the things that you can control and, and versus the things that you can't, you know. Are, are you somebody? Are you, are you free? Someone who's gotten sober? Did no, you, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. But You're just I, familiar I, with the program. I have lots of friends, you know, yeah. I mean, who've gone through it, and and um, you know, and there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of crossover with with. with the 12 step program and, and, cog and cognitive behavioral therapy as well. You know, that well, that's the greatest done, program in the world. Are, that yeah. 12 step. I mean, there's things that yeah. they should be teaching that in school. Exactly. I Coping mean, they're, they're, skills. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I yeah. mean, it's, it's great. Yeah. Are, are you someone that's gotten sober? No, but I did yeah. something called ACOA. It's adult children of alcoholics and okay. dysfunctional families. It's yeah. a yellow workbook. Let me tell you, it changed my life. And I've been wow. studying self-development stuff yeah. actively since I'm, I'm 57, so uh, you know, certainly 25 years. Yeah, wow. And uh, that book literally changed my life. I mean, wow. beyond anything, I I got so much more out of that. Yeah. I, it was because I had a really difficult childhood, and it it addressed those messages specifically. Right. You know, I don't have a thank God. I mean, I have had addicts around me in my family, but I don't have that gene. Thank goodness. Yeah, that's great. Um, Oh, believe me, it's good. But uh, it addressed so many things. Now, almost every step was like an aha moment. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'd recommend that to anybody, anybody who had a difficult childhood or you have residual behavior or things fucking up your head. It's ACOA, adult children of alcohol. Even if you didn't have alcoholic parents, yeah. I did not have alcoholic parents. They had other addictive problems. But um yeah, I recommend that it's a sixteen dollar book on Amazon. It'd be the best amount, cool. of best money, your my highest return on investment I ever had. Cool. cool. So much so that uh, we have uh, on Thanksgiving, we you know have three kids, and it's like you know they always come over with their boyfriends and girlfriends, and we have this little book, 
like a Thanksgiving, you have to write what you're thankful for. And my wife wrote in there, I'm so happy Craig did this program. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. well, I'm, I'm less of an asshole, but I didn't realize how much less of an asshole I was. <laughs> but, but I'm happy. I mean, I'm, hey, I'm moving in the right direction. It only right took on, 25 years. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, yeah. But no, I'm same thing. I'm from, I've had a lot of people in my life and certainly tons of guests on the shows have gotten sober. And I, and I yeah, yeah. always bond well with people that are into that program yeah. because it's really, it's so smart. I wish, yeah, you know, totally. yep. uh, so what was, what was the most, what was the most important lesson? I got so consumed with your answer. I, yeah, no, I was saying I'm, 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 you know, kind of in line with what we were talking about earlier. I'm just learning to, um, I think life is teaching me that I can be a lot more comfortable if I learn to let go of things that I'm unable to control. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And do my best with those, with the things that I can, you know, totally, totally, man, that definitely. And that's the whole foundation of like, you know, all these, every one of these programs pretty totally. much. Yeah. Totally. Even, even if you're going to like to an, a non program, totally. Uh, any final words of wisdom? And then I want to tell oh, people where God. to find you. Oh my God. Um, God, I, 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 I wish I had something wise to say. My, no, if that's... Uh, you know what? I think I don't think I don't think so. I think it, I, I don't think I do right now. That's totally cool, man. I want to tell people. <laughs> thank you very much. For, thanks for being so sincere and so cool and so open. I really appreciate oh, your time. It was really nice to meet you, and yeah, uh, I hope to see you down here sometime. Man, um, thanks for inviting me. Or next time I'm in the city. Yeah, um, absolutely. Let me tell people where to find you. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt's a brilliant guitar player. I'd love everybody to check him out in a couple of different places. His website, mattstevensmusic.com, has everything on there. Uh, his new record, which is coming out October 1st, October 1st is called Pittsburgh. And if you uh, follow him on Instagram at Matthew Thomas Wyatt, if they look up Matt Stevens, will, they, will, it, will, it, will it show up? I think up? so. I think okay, if they but look up Matthew Stevens, it'll show up. Yeah. Look up Matthew Stevens and yeah. follow him on Instagram and he'll let you know as, as it gets closer to Pittsburgh dropping. And he's got four other records. If you are into improvisational music at all, uh, you'll find some joy in each of them because they're very good records. Uh, also, Matt is available for lessons. Uh, best thing uh, for two things for tracks. If you if you like Matt's playing and you wanted to play in the tracks, Go to his website, mattstevensmusic.com, and there's a contact tab there, and send him, obviously, the track that you're interested in, and he can get back to you and, and go for Why do you think he'd be a good fit for it? Same thing if you're interested in lessons. Uh, you know, let him know what you're looking for, where you're at, you know, guitar playing-wise, and what, you know, is there something about his playing you like? Do you want to just have a consult about how he approaches something? Just give him that information so he can make a, a logical, you know, a, a conscious decision to get back to you in the right way to serve you best. Um, and Anything else I can promote? I think that's it, man. That's great. Nope. No Matt Stevens t-shirts, nothing. <laughs> Not yet. See, that's next time, man. <laughs> next time. Um, man, thank you very much for everything. Hold on one second. Wrap. So yeah. I really appreciate your time. And oh, uh, dude, best of luck with everything me. that you're doing. Thanks, Craig. It's great to meet you, man. And yeah, and please stay in touch, huh? I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. man. I'll see you. I'll see you. Yeah. Let me know if you're ever out my way and I'll do the same for sure. I, I promise. Hang on okay. one second. We'll wrap this up. Yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Matt Stevens. Again, check him out at mattstevensmusic.com. The new album is called Pittsburgh, and he's got four other records there. If you're into improvisational music, you'll love it. It's also around for tracks and for lessons. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play a guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thanks so much, brother. Thanks, man.